The exhibit is a collection of images, advertisements, from the late 1920s to the early 1950s of tobacco ads from a variety of companies. Beginning in the mid-20s, tobacco companies understood that the public was becoming concerned about the health implications of smoking. Prior to this time, there were a few rare cancers known to be associated with tobacco. But by the 1920s and 1930s, the lung cancer rate is skyrocketing. And people start finding all kinds of filth in tobacco, arsenic, lead, uh, diethylene glycol, other poisons. Uh, in the United States itself, at the end of the 19th century, a third of the entire federal revenues were from tobacco taxes. So tobacco has been a, a huge source of revenue for states throughout the world, and that's one of the main reasons governments are so reluctant to take any reasonable steps to, to halt the epidemic. Tobacco ads have been extremely effective over the years in luring people to smoke, retaining them in smoking, and luring them from one brand to another brand. These guys had enormous art budgets. They had the very best artists and the very best designers that money could buy. Some of the themes that we have in the exhibit, and there are a series of them, one of them is um, the image of the doctor. Many famous movie stars and athletes were portrayed specifically this individual. Ronald Reagan supports, Joe DiMaggio supports this cigarette or that. With doctors, it's never a specific individual, but they come right out of central casting. They're wise, they're humane. As a matter of fact, the images show the doctor in the very best possible light. That's why organized medicine didn't object. Very few physicians at the time saw this as an evil or a danger. And by drafting off of medical authority, the cigarette companies seek to reassure the public that their product wasn't dangerous, even though it was, and they knew it to be so at the time. The industry was definitely tailoring its campaign to whatever the hot worry issues were. So in the 19th century, already you had people like President uh, Grant dying of throat cancer from, from smoking a pipe. And so throat cancer was recognized as, as it was called a tobacco cancer a, or a cancer of smoking. And that's one of the reasons the throat was focused on early, this, this idea of a T-zone, throat and taste. The industry also talked about things like toasting, you know, we toast our tobacco, and that's because some people had worried about tobacco as a cause of tuberculosis, and the idea was that toasting was like sterilization, and so we sterilize our, our tobacco so it's free of, free of germs. One of the other devices they used was um, tread on the public's uh, belief in science. Uh, this was a time before the skepticism of today about science, you know, science during this era um, was, you know, Buck Rogers and beyond, you know, people looked towards the future very optimistically. It was before the atomic bomb, for example. So the cigarette industries understood this authority. So they used pseudoscience. You might see a, um, somebody who's obviously a scientist sitting with the cigarette looking through a microscope. Or a scientist with um, an early space program motif behind them or a scientist with a laboratory behind them. And very often they quoted scientific studies that were completely invalid. Often they were paid for by the industry to make a specific point rather than to ask a question. And that these were very simplistically put out as scientific findings about the safety of their tobacco product. Marketing to women is very clever. Before World War I, if a woman was seen smoking, it was a direct code for prostitution. Normal, God-fearing women simply didn't smoke. Now, beginning with the women's suffrage movement and with the sense of women's independence in the 20s, the companies began to sponsor um, learning sessions for women to teach them how to smoke and how to inhale and how to fashionably hold a cigarette. So by smoking, you're going to stick it to your husband or stick it to your father or whatever, and this is a sense of your freedom. In the 20s, they had this wonderful... Uh, Wonderful, I say, in the sense that it brings wonderment. Reach for a lucky instead of a sweet. You know, directly uh, looking at women's waistlines. You know, if you don't smoke, you're going to eat more. And, and this is a common theme in advertising through the years, although there it was very clearly articulated. Now, beginning in the 30s and 40s, it became very fashionable. And women are often shown in very elegant poses, looking like movie stars, you know, holding cigarettes in a very sophisticated way. When I asked my mother why she began smoking. 
oh, it was the sophisticated thing to do. The tobacco industry has an unusual marketing problem. People begin using their products, begin smoking, when they're teenagers or young adults. Nobody essentially as an adult begins smoking, very few. You might entice an older adult to change to your brand, but you're not going to start them smoking. So a lot of ads, even today, are aimed at starter smokers because that's the lifeblood of the profits of the tobacco industry. Now in these days, you would actually have pictures of young teenagers and saying, gee, I like this cigarette better than that cigarette. And they're often, you know, playing sports or at a party or something that would indicate a happy time and that their happiness is contributed by smoking. Santa Claus was in literally dozens and dozens of tobacco ads, including some wonderful ones, where Santa is sitting there puffing and blowing great streams of smoke out. You know, this is clearly targeted at a youthful uh, audience. When you look at how overtly hucksterish those that era was from the 20s to the 50s to realize although that's obviously false what's going on today is no different that the tobacco companies although they're constrained by regulation by the government they found very subtle and insidious ways um, to corrupt the message and that even today marketing to young people to begin smoking marketing to women marketing to blacks and indeed even the anti-smoking programs aimed at, at grade school and high school kids are often coded messages that really support smoking. You have the effort to promote smoking in Africa, in the former Soviet Union, Latin America, and of course China, Asia in general. This is where the big market is because a lot of the American consumers have, have realized what the hazards are and smoking rates are on the decline. But in many parts of the world, the epidemic is really just beginning and that's why the 21st century is going to be the gigantic period of, of the epidemic. Most of the smoking deaths are in the future. Only about 100 million people died from smoking in the 20th century. In the 21st century, it could be as many as a billion people, 10 times as many, because again, the long time lag, the marketing overseas, the epidemic is really mostly in the future.